On today's episode of the Combo Podcast, we're going to take a serious note and we're going to cover the language and the symbolism of the coronavirus pandemic or pandemic, whichever perception you choose to embrace. And today joining me for that very important topic is renowned world researcher, occult, spiritual, intelligent man who has spent years of his life seeking truth since 1959, Jordan Maxwell from jordanmaxwellshow.com. How are you today, sir? Oh, very good, I think. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> so the first thing that popped into my mind when I looked into the news, and I know that you personally abhor the current event talks and talking about politicians, and we won't be talking about politicians. We're going to be talking about the big term, long term agenda. The word that pops out is Corona. Now, if we do a research of the word Corona, it that hints means crown. Exactly. Thank you, sir. Please take it away. It means a crown. And in England, there are two different kinds of government. There's a government of England, and then there's a crown government of England. The crown is a one-mile square part of the city of London. It's called the London Corporation. It's a one-mile square in the city of London, Greater London, there's a small, little, one-mile square city called the Crown. <clears throat> and the Crown is a one-mile square, as I said, of all of the international banking cartels of the world. The biggest banking cartels on the earth are all in that one-mile square in London. And therefore, when you see the queen, the queen does not represent the crown. The queen represents the royalty of the British royalty or the German royalty of England. The queen is not British. She's a German. And she supported Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. The, the royalty of England were very pro-Nazi. And so <clears throat> they did not, the, but the queen does not represent the crown of England. The crown is a privately owned organization in England. It's a privately owned banking fraternities. Many different banks of the world are what we call the crown in, in uh, England and in, in London. And so it's a very interesting subject about words and terms and where they come from. And I think that this whole uh, virus thing, from what I have been able to hear from the experts that I know on the inside, that this was all planned as a political move to bring down the United States. As long as everybody stays home, there's no business. Companies are going out of out of business. The companies are folding. People are being laid off, and and uh, pi airline pilots are, are, are out of work. And uh, doctors are busy trying to you know, keep everybody healthy. But it looks like this whole thing was planned, and so that's why I call it a uh, not a pandemic, but a plandemic. I think it's a political move on the part of some very powerful people in this country who don't like what's going on and who are going to strike back at the government, at the federal government level, by shutting America down. And that, I think that's what's happening. We are being attacked by some extremely powerful people. Another aspect that comes to this, just to tie into what you're saying, if you bear with me, the corona is also a reference to the rising sun, the golden dawn. And <laughs> yeah, yeah and that's exactly right. Right. And we're going to interconnect it to what you're talking about, the banking cartel. So on March the 15th, the Federal Reserve said that they were going to the March of Ides, by the way, they had announced that they're here to help us with more stimulus money. And in what you're talking about, the corona being the crown and is a symbol of the royal cartel in the city of London, it interconnects with finance. So the rising sun, finance and worldwide authoritarianism or communism. Can you explain us that angle? What do you think about that, Jordan? I think you're exactly correct. This is precisely what I see. That the symbol for world communism, if you go back to the Soviet Union, founded back in the 1920s, the Soviet Union, 
the symbol, the national coat of arms and the symbol for the Soviet Communist Party was a rising sun. It was called, the symbol was called the dawn of a new day for the whole world. The idea being that when Russia was founded as the Soviet Union, it was going to be dominating the entire world for the rest of our lives with world communism. And the symbol for the World Communist Party was a sunrise with the spokes of the sunrise being a corona. The word corona gives us our word crown because the crowns, ancient crowns, used to have points on them. It would be a circle for the crown, but they have points. And so they later on, they took the points of the crown and widened them out to make it look like a sunrise, like like the Statue of Liberty today has a crown of thorns. And uh, and so the thorns were used to be straight up on a crown, but now they're out, they're out laid out into a circle. And so that's why we have the Statue of Liberty with the crown of thorns. So the crown of thorns was actually the sun rays off of the sun, and it was called a corona. And that's why when I first heard about this, coronavirus that was my first thought what you said was my first thought what does this have to do with the corona of the sunrise on the world communism the world revolutionary government that's taking over the earth and ripping everybody off and stealing everything from the whole world they're called the illuminati i started talking about the illuminati back in 1967 in the late part of 1967, I was doing a series of lectures around Los Angeles, and I started talking about the secret societies of Illuminati that were financing and organizing a world movement, a world political movement at that time called World Communism. And today, the World Communist Party is still using that symbol of a rising sun like a coronavirus. And that's why I know there's something going on here on a very dark and deep level that nobody is looking at. But I think it's interesting you've picked up on that, the same as I did. When I heard about corona, I thought corona is a, is a crown. The crown in London financed the Communist Party. That's where it came from, from London, the money. Back, in, back when the Communist Party was being set up in 1848, that's where the money was coming from, is from the banking cartels in England financing the Communist Party. And they financed, Adolf, they financed Hitler, they financed so many of the different terrorist organizations around the world. There's just a very big story going on here on here that most people are totally unaware of, have no idea in the world that's going on. It's been going on since 1848 with the founding of the Communist Party. And so this coronavirus, I, I believe, is not a pandemic, it's a plandemic, P-L-A-N. It virtually was planned to happen by the international powers of this world that are behind the United Nations, that are the people who are behind the fall of nations and, and financial empires. We are under attack. America is under attack, and so the idea is, is that if you can knock America out, everybody else will fall in line with this new world order under the United Nations. But you got to get rid of the United States of America because it's too powerful, it's too big, too many important people here, too much money, too much brain. So you got to get rid of the big guy on the block before everybody else will fall in line. So the only way to f defeat us is to cut our blood supply off. The only way to defeat us, you can't defeat us in battle. We've got too big of an army, too big of a military presence on the earth. The only way you're going to defeat the United States of America is to cut off its supply of food, cut off its supply, make everybody stay home, shut down factories, shut down business, shut down the American system of government on the earth. 
And when you shut America down, the people are going to starve and have no jobs. And then the people are going to wake up and find out what world communism is really all about. Now and we're going to begin to see what I've been talking about since 1960. I was started talking about this kind of stuff back in 1960. That's, that last year was 60 years. I've been doing this kind of talking about these uh, secret societies which are all ultimately trying to overthrow world governments and different governments of the world, not just one government, the United Nations, but overthrowing all the governments around the world to bring the whole world of mankind under a novas ordo cyclorum, which is on the back of the $1 bill beneath the pyramid the new order of the world, a new world order in which America will no longer be of any value. People are going to be out of work and starving in this country, and the entire system we call the United States will no longer exist. And Henry Kissinger uh, said, if you control oil, you can control the nations. If you control food, you control people. And as of recently, he has t talked about the coronavirus pa pandemic and how the world order needs to double down to make sure that they retain their power. Now, mm. I th the important yeah. part, too, to remember, because you said, well, I'm glad that we both are looking at this. The truth no will set you free. And we're out there. And I think these conversations really help to elucidate people's mind about it, because mm -hmm. the, the powers that shouldn't be like like you already know, Jordan, they don't plan in five to 10 years. They plan in 50, 100 years so that we don't see what is the developing pattern. So. I've noticed in the language that is being used in the narrative of this crisis is almost in biblical terms as well. So I researched the word crisis a little bit and I linked you to that article. And can you talk about the word crisis and how it relates to biblical terms? And then also we're talking about the, the, the crown of thorns. Now that's an inter interesting point too. Yeah, well the crown of thorns that Jesus supposedly died with the crown of thorns. <clears throat> is a corona, a crown of thorns, and those thorns are the sun rays. And this is why we call Jesus God's son, the light of the world, because the sun, S-U-N, is the light that lights our world. So when you talk about Jesus being this God's son, the light of the world, Jesus is a just a word because you go back to the ancient uh, Greek in the ancient Greek civilizations, the sun was called Helios, and there was a city in Egypt called Heliopolis, which means the city of the sun. Opolis is a city, and Helios was the sun. Today, there's a city called Heliopolis, and so it's called the city of the sun. So, sun worship was a very powerful worship in Egypt, and it has spread to the whole world. The entire world of mankind is under sun worship today. We all, no matter what nation you're in, worship the sun because the sun is the greatest power in our little life on this, in this little, uh, uh, what, what would you call it, in our solar system, the solar system. And so the idea of giving your heart to God or giving your heart to God's son you know, people, Christians say they're giving their heart to Jesus. They're giving their heart to God's son. Well, that's what the Aztecs and the Mayas used to do. They would take some guy once a year and put him on an altar and cut his chest open and pull out the heart and hand it up to the sky. And it was called a blood sacrifice. So they were, instead of you giving your heart to the Lord, the Aztecs had a better idea. They give somebody else's heart to the Lord, cut his heart out and give it to the Lord, not mine. And so the whole idea is there's a religious, political, ancient, secret society movement on the earth that's been around for thousands of years, guiding the destiny of the human race. And we just don't know anything about it. We've never read anything about it. We have no idea in the world what's going on. International politics, we don't know. 
I'm glad that you mentioned the secret societies and the blood sacrifices because it goes towards that and this conversation is going to cover those issues. And the important part that I really want you to talk about, if you care to explain a little bit more, is how every group of every society in history or a group of people has had um, an elite or a minority. They hold the truth to the grander myth or noble lie that they give to the people. And you've mentioned like these uh, ancient societies like the Aztecs, they had blood sacrifices or secret contracts with dark influences. So that's, that's exactly the, right. Secret can you please contract talk about that? with dark influences. That's exactly right. And so do we. Today, our churches and our religions have secret contracts with very powerful secret stuff going on in the, in the demonic and spiritual world. And that's why it works so well, is because the spiritual part of these contracts keep control over our minds for the contract to work. So there are demonic spirits on this earth that are guiding the human race, that's guiding us to become alcoholics and drug addicts and wars and violence and uh, all kinds of human degradation. It's really destructive what's going on on the human race, but it's being led by spiritual forces that our forefathers have made deals with. And that's why we are feeling the effects of it now. And when you get into religion, that's a very big subject. And I could talk for hours on the, all the stuff that's been hidden, totally hidden from the human family about religions and theologies, churches, synagogues, mosques, and where they come from, who finances these religions, where did they come from, what did the words mean? It's a very big story, and it's really about time somebody wakes up and finds out where we are as a human race and why we're killing each other in wars and violence and then killing ourselves with drugs and alcohol and killing our children by not teaching them, sending them to school so that they could crawl on their knees to the emperor and they have no idea in the world what's going on. People go to school for years and years and years and come out and have no idea in the world what words mean what the symbols mean, how the government operates. We have no idea in the world what's going on on this earth. And it's about time somebody starts waking up and start answering some questions that are very big as to who we are, where did we come from as humans, and where are we going? And it's about time we start looking at those kind of questions. We definitely are going to explore those questions, and I want to bring up in this conversation a reference back to what you said. If the United States could be put down in a symbolic in symbolic terms, then we're going to talk about the ritualist ritualization of the hum, of hum, humiliating the public. Because I think, if I understand you correctly, Jordan, you're saying that if the I would see the United States as a symbol of freedom, and in general, there's a libertarian culture. And what has happened with this pandemic and this humiliation of the public, because they must submit to the authoritarian mafiosos in order for them to be safe. That's that's the narrative that is being pushed. So if I understand it correctly, they must destroy the symbol of freedom for us to lose our power. Is that a an accurate re review or re resume? I would think that was pretty accurate. And that was very uh, insightful. Yeah, a very interesting concept, very interesting uh, insight. And I hadn't thought of it that way. But it is true that they have to destroy the, the, the back of the American people, of this idea about a freedom and liberty and justice has got to be destroyed off the earth because the powers that be, the, and the international criminal syndicates at the, at the top of the world that are controlling our human destiny, they are not interested in people being free to do what they want to do. They want absolute control. You're not free when you're in the mafia. You're not free when you're in the Ku Klux Klan. You're not free when you're in a gang. There's no such a thing as freedom. When you're in a gang, you're, in the, you're not free. You do what you're told, and you go with the flow and do what everybody else does. Or you're going to get hurt because there is no freedom in totalitarian fascism. 
And that's what we got going on on the earth today. The little bit of freedom that the human race is, thinks it has is going to be wiped out completely so that when this, this virus thing is over, we're no longer going to be the same kind of people. It's no longer going to be the United States of America and with freedom and liberty and all that because it hasn't been free. We haven't been free since 1870s. There's a very big story here that people have never been told about the country we live in. <clears throat> so I like to also tie in because we're moving into this bigger and bigger, more, I guess, dark topic to those people who are not initiated into these occult mysteries. And one thing that jumps out in my attention talking about words is quarantine. Now, again, if you backtrack and do some research on that word, it is Dell's. Uh, it goes back to Italian mercantilism, and quarantine. Quara means four or forty forty, and you know I or forty or what I started thinking about this. The the language and the symbolism is is put in biblical terms, and there are some religious groups who, especially the Jewish, the Jews, who are thinking that this is the judgment day. So crisis, quarantine, all that refers or hints to judgment day. Now. Uh, Jordan, am I incorrect? What do you think? No, actually, there's a, there was an article on the web from one of the big reference works, one of the big uh, encyclopedias, talking about 9-11. <clears throat> and it said 9-11 was a very important day to Jewish banking interests. All around the world, the date of 9-11 was understood by Jews and the Jewish banking fraternities to be the beginning of God's kingdom. God's kingdom would begin in September 11, 2001. And so <clears throat> I look at that, and that's in the reference books. I can send you a copy of the, of the uh, page where it talks about God's kingdom from the Jewish standpoint of view, from the Jewish standpoint, God's kingdom begins on 9-11, the beginning of the end of the, of the Gentile world and the beginning of the Jewish world of power, power, politics, and international money. And then when you understand who founded the state of Israel, where did it come from? It hasn't got anything to do with the Jewish religion. It was founded by the British. The English government founded Israel. And it was financed and organized and protected by America, with the American troops went into that area we call the people of Cana, the land of Cana, and it was referred to as renamed Israel. So that today, England and America controls Israel, period. And it's an incredible story about how international politics actually works. <clears throat> so, no, it that it comes to a critical point in time now because people need to pay attention in the sense that their livelihoods depend on this. And from what I understand it, this is an ongoing game. It's a perennial game. You know, the, the, the costumes and the names may change, but ultimately the game of power is the same. So uh, here on the agenda, it seems like this judgment day motif is being pushed and the the weak are being separated from the shaft and mm -hmm. in their inverted mind in the elite let's let's make sure we're clear about this because we're using biblical terms but for those who are luciferian enlightened they have a different understanding of what these words and symbols use so it's an inversion so this separation of the weak from the shaft uh jordan maxwell it goes back to an idea of them uh, calling the herd or, you know, what does that say to you in relation to the coming Easter or Astara and, you know, May Day coming on? Does any of that ring any truth to you? What do you think, sir? Yes. Uh, you know, when you talk about the entire operation on this earth as a game, if you're a hunter in Africa and you have to, uh, you want to go on a safari to for hunting, you got to go to a game warden. You got to get a gaming license. And when you're killing an elephant or killing a, uh, an animal in Africa, it's called big game hunting. 
And so the word game is used in relation to killing other life forms. And therefore, you got to go to a gaming commission to get your gaming license. If you're going to go out and kill animals and kill birds, you got to get a uh, go to a gaming commission. And that's why when you are going to set up a, uh, a, a hotel in Las Vegas to make a killing, you got to you got to go to the gaming commission. So this whole idea of the killing and creating of power and money is a game. It's a very powerful game. And it's being played by people who know exactly how to play the game. And it's not for us to know. We're not in the game. We are the game. They're playing about killing us, about knocking down our governments and destroying our welfare and our destroying our income and our country and destroying the whole idea of freedom. They don't want people thinking in terms of being free because the, the whole idea of international organized crime is to have control over money, <clears throat> governments, and the activities of humans. <clears throat> They're not interested in you being free to do whatever you want to do. No more freedom. They're getting rid of freedom. We're going to knock down the United States, knock down the whole idea of the American system of government <clears throat> and, and put in place of the government, put in place of the original government of 1776. Today we have something called the United States criminal justice system implying that the justice system we live under is administered by criminals. It's called U.S. criminal justice. And therefore, you have to go to court. Why do you go to court? Because you play basketball and tennis on a court. How do you play tennis on a court? You play with a racket. The whole thing is a criminal justice. The entire apparatus in America today talking about law is a criminal operation. It's called criminal justice. And that's why the judges will tell you there is no justice. There's just us. We decide what the truth is and what, what you get and what you don't get. It's just us. And so <clears throat> it's a very big story about words and terms and why we, you know, uh, I could give you so many examples of how we're being fooled. Let me give you one example quickly about how we are being lied to and tricked into believing something that's not true. And I am not a lawyer. I am not practicing law. I'm not giving you any legal uh, understanding at all. I'm merely giving you an entertainment. I am explaining something to you to entertain you and to educate you. I'm not suggesting you do anything about it because you'll get in trouble if you try and do something about what I'm talking about. So just listen to me for entertainment and education, not not to practice law. Uh, Jordan Maxwell has been talking about what rules the world, which is the words, the symbolism, the terms that are unknown to us and are taken for granted. There is an elite mafioso cartel that is all a game to them. They can create money out of thin air and they are above the law. And so Jordan Maxwell is talking about if you go drive a car and you're stopped by an officer of the law and he gives you a ticket, that's where we are. Jordan, pick yeah. it up. Please. So when he gives you a ticket. He's carrying the ticket himself. It's his ticket. And he writes out the ticket explaining how much he's going to charge you with. You've been charged with doing this. You've been charged with going 60 miles an hour. You've been charged with the illegal turn. So he's writing out the ticket. He's going to charge you and you're expected to pay the ticket. But what you don't know is if he, when it's his ticket, he's the one that's holding it. And he writes out the, the charges on the ticket and then signs it. Then he hands the ticket to you and you're expected to sign it and pay the ticket. But what he didn't tell you, and the government doesn't tell you, nobody knows and nobody's ever told you, you are at that moment a co-signer on a ticket 
in commerce. The ticket is a commercial instrument, meaning you have to pay it. Because it's the same thing when you go into a big department store and buy a pair of shoes, they're going to give you a ticket and you're expected to pay it. You sign it and you're going to pay the ticket. So that's what happens when the cop stops you. He's going to sign, fill out the ticket, he's going to sign it, and he's going to give it to you and you sign it. But when you sign it, you are, in fact, by law, a co-signer. So if you don't have the money to buy the TV, I go in there with you and I co-sign for you. That means if you don't pay the ticket, I'm taking on the responsibility and I'll pay it. If you don't pay it, I'm your co-signer. Well, you are a co-signer to the cop that's writing out the ticket. He signed it first. You're the second one. You co-signed it, which means if you take that ticket, photocopy the ticket, you keep the original, and you send in the picture of the ticket to the Secretary of State in the state in which you live. They're called Secretary of State. You send that ticket in with a, with an affidavit that's been <clears throat> signed by you that says you have decided you don't want to co-sign for a ticket in commerce. You didn't know that's what was happening, and that you were co-signing. And so you tell the Secretary of State, I don't wish to co-sign for this. I didn't know I was co-signing for a ticket and commerce. The Secretary of State will then send that letter that you sent in, send it to the, the, the Treasury Department of the state in which you live, and the state treasurer will send that ticket to the cop, and he has to pay it because it's his ticket, and he's the one that signed it first. You were an undersigner, but the cop has to pay his own ticket. So whatever he gave you, he has to pay it, not you. How many people know that that's, what, that's the way it works? You are an undersigner to the cop. He's the one that signed it first, and he's the one that had the ticket, and he signed it first. You were an undersigner, a co-signer, and you're not responsible to pay the ticket. He is. It's his ticket. So how many people know that? Not many. I know that because I've done the research and I know what's going on in this country. I know how it works and why you go to court because you play tennis on a court. You play with a racket. And how are you playing in a court? You're playing with the American criminal justice system. It's called criminal justice because the justice is being administered in the courts by the criminals. And you need to understand the basis for all American law today is the planet Saturn. Saturn was the god of the Jews. Saturn was referred to by Judaism as the Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is the planet Saturn because he is the Lord of the Rings. And the Lord of the Rings, if you look in the reference book, Saturn was called the god of the black robe. He was always pictured as a god wearing a black robe. That's why judges wear black robes. They're representing Saturn. The judges wear black robes. The uh, Darth Vader in the movie wears black robes. When you graduate from university, you wear a black robe. You wear a black square mortarboard on your head when you graduate. All of this is going back to the worship of the planet Saturn. And on the north pole of the planet Saturn, we found out when we sent, uh, when we sent the probes out to look at the planet Saturn, we found out that on the north pole of the planet Saturn is a hexagon, what we call the Star of David. The Star of David is on the north pole of the planet Saturn. How many people know about the origins of religion and government and law and the corruption of the powerful people who are playing us as a fool? We're being played like a fool. We go along with it because we don't know what's going on. We have no understanding, and we don't want to know. All we're interested in in this country are important things. We want to know the, the ball game score and the, is the beer cold? 
and how much are we paying for entertainment and chasing the women and drinking beer and watching entertainment on television and going to the game. We are very concerned about ball games. We got all kinds of games in America, which based on a ball, football, baseball, soccer ball, tennis ball, ping pong ball, bowling ball, uh, football. We got all kinds of ball games. Why? Because ball are, is a fun thing for animals. Animals, you throw a ball out in the yard with the dogs and the dogs will play with the ball all day. You do it with cats and cats will play with a ball all day. Why? Because animals love to play with a ball. That's why our masters who own us give us a ball game so we could go out and watch them play ball. And that's what they tell us in work and our, and, our, and, and our employment. They tell us this is a, a team player here. They want you on the team. And so you begin to see how we have been misled into believing things about our life that are not true. I'm not playing ball. You know, if you don't play ball, you're going to get kicked out. So I'm not playing ball. I paid the hell of a price to be who I am and know what I know. And you're going to pay too. If you want to know the real truth, you're going to pay dearly. And when you find out how this world really works and what's actually going on and who's really running your country, you're going to be very, very upset and disappointed because nobody ever told you what was really happening to your country, into your life, and your own destiny of your family. It's a hell of a story of treason and betrayal. So and I would important... love to have people wake up and find out who really is running their life for them. I think they will wake up when the necessity is more than their desire to live life by pleasure. And the story that you mentioned about the ticket and the cop, it illustrates sovereignty, what it means. Sovereign means above the law, and there are two sets of reality. And for the masters, they are the facts for them. They understand historically that there is a spiritual realm. So the battlefield is spiritual. And for those who are below them, or so they think, we can't see the spirit because we're caught up in our own ignorance. And this is why I brought you here, Jordan Maxwell, because it's an important research. You've journey throughout life and had a lot of difficulties and this is not something that is just going to be all lollipops and sunshine this is an arduous task and so we are here today in this battle and we're here again i want to mention the idea of the judgment day because a lot of these religious mafiosos they really want to push the idea of an armageddon of a spiritual battle separating the weak from the shaft now sir knowing that this is a spiritual battle and that there are two sets of realities. Now, how is it that you know that there is an unseen world full of spirits? Well, first of all, logic alone would dictate that because all of us have had too many experiences that we cannot explain, things which do not make sense but which have happened. And, and incidentally, in Rome, the home of mafia, La Cosa Nostra, the Italian syndicates. You have something called the Pope. The Pope is referred to as the Holy Father. The Holy Father in Rome, why is he holy? Because he represents God. He's a Godfather. Get it? Yeah. Mafiosi, the Godfather. The Holy Father who represents God in Rome. And that's why today all of the presidents and kings and rulers and royalty and all the big wealthy people of the world, all the most important people of the world, all eventually go to Rome and bow on their knees and kiss the Godfather's ring. That's what you need to do if you want to be anybody in this world. You need to acknowledge who the boss is. It's the Pope. And you go on your knees and you kiss his ring. And you better kiss his ring. Just like the, the old man that was kissing the Godfather's ring and Godfather won the first movie. Oh, yeah. And they knew, they understand the, um, 
there was an anecdote that you shared from a very famous mafioso, and I, the name escapes me. For, for he's a Chicago mobster, Al Capone. That's his name. And uh, the anecdote, I believe, is how he had a free reign to be a psychopath because he let he did what his masters told him to do. So. Yes. The, there is no distinction between the government and the mafia. The mafia is the same criminal element, but from my understanding, these people who are the underbosses of the street mafias, they're just doing the janitorial work of the ultra bosses on the top. Now the That's question That's exactly what's right. It's the janitorial work of the big bosses who run this world. And who and if they can if they want something done and they don't want to do it because it would make them look bad if they did it. So they hire the mob to do their dirty work and because of that there's a payoff so they have to pay the mob and their payoff to the mob for doing their dirty work is we leave you alone let you go do your thing if you're going to kill somebody on rob rob banks or whatever it is we'll let you do that go do whatever you want to do just do what we tell you to do when we need you that's all you need to know so now the question is who and I, I mean we have some clues we have some hints but again we're the intention of this conversation is so we can alert humanity that there is someone in control there are some entities dark influences that we cannot see so the people who are in the top of the pyramid who whose orders are they following they're following a very powerful secret society based on spiritual connections the guys who run our planet are very highly religious people, extremely religious, and that they believe that there are spirits, dark spirits that we in the Western world call demons and devils, angels and all that kind of thing, poltergeists, demons and, and, and ghosts and devils. There, That's true. There is a presence on the earth just like that. Yes, there are demons and there are devils and poltergeists and spirits, and they are leading the whole world and the people who know how to follow their directions and do whatever they're told to do, they rise in prominence and become our, our congressmen, our senators, our leaders, our religious leaders, our popes. The papacy is the most criminal organization on the face of the earth. It's the home of the Godfather. The Holy Father who, who represents God. He's a God Father. And that's why nobody, nobody can touch him. He's wearing white and you must wear a darker color when you're in his presence. And only he can wear white. Only he can wear white because he is protected by white magic. And then you have the Jesuits who are the promoters of all the darkness and all the violence and drug addiction and wars and all the criminality of the gangs and, and, and organized crime. That's all Jesuits. And the head of the Jesuit order in the Catholic Church wears all black. So the Pope wears all white and the Jesuits wear all black. They are the original men in black. And that's what's going on. And in this individuals, you're saying that they're highly religious because they understand what is the true science or the magic that makes the world go round. For us, they have these noble lies or these myths that, you know, there is a man uh, <laughs> who uh, like Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that, you know, he's a fictitious entity, but let's be honest about a lot of the patterns and the problems with what the Bible has shown is that people in authority will hijack it co-opted and mistranslate purposefully to dupe people into submission because that's exactly right that's what's happened too right and this criminal mafia has a religion and that religion deals with special contracts with dark influences or dark energies and culturally they've been present throughout different civilizations so that's the thing this contract and again i'm going to pass it over to you jordan it's written in blood it, am i Incorrect. It's exactly written in blood. More than you know. Let me give you an example. Uh, on your, the United States of America, as it was founded, was founded as a republic back in the ninth, back in the seventeen seventies, seventeen eighties. 
the United States of America was founded. But at in 1860s, we had a civil war in this country. And it was decided that there was no longer could we be called, by law, no longer could we be called United States because we weren't united. We had a civil war. So therefore, we're not united. And we're not going to be called United States anymore because we're not united. Half of our country was killing the other half. And so the fact of the matter is, since we weren't united, but we have millions of people still here, they still want to eat, they still want to go to school, they have children, they still want to build a life. There are millions and millions of people here. So what are you going to do with them if you don't have a country anymore? If you, There is no United States of America. We're not united. Well, that was decided by... The, uh, the international banking cartels that were running this government, the people who really were in power in this government, decided that they would have to change the kind of government we live under. So they said, no longer are we going to be a United States of America. But what, what we need to do is start a private corporation. And they started a corporation, incorporated it in Delaware. It's a Delaware corporation. You can get copies of the corporate papers today from Delaware. And it was called, the corporation was called the United States Incorporated, the United States Corporation. And they said in the corporate papers, anyone who would be working for our corporation will be called a citizen. And the corporation is called the United States Corporation. So if you're working for the corporation, you are a citizen of a corporation, not a country, not the republic. So therefore, today, if you go into court, you can't tell the judge, well, I'm an American and I have rights. You don't have any rights. You are an employee of a foreign corporation called United States. It was incorporated in 1870s. And therefore, if I see you coming out of a restaurant one night, I'm going into the restaurant and you're coming out and you have a girl with you. I see you with this girl and I call you the next day and I say to you, Hector, you better watch out. That girl you were with last night, she's bad company. You better watch out for her. And you say to me, mind your own business. We're getting married and she's going to be my partner. What are you talking about? Uh, business, partner, company? You're talking about commerce, business. Those are words that's used in business and corporations with company, business, and corporation. And so business is business of life. If you're getting married, that's a business. And therefore, you got to get a license. It's a business license to do business. And happily, uh, who you're marrying is none of my business. And who you're sleeping with is none of my business. But who I marry and who I'm with is none of your business. Why? Because it is a business. And therefore, if your business doesn't work out, you're not going to God. You're going to court. You better bring your house and your car and everything else. You're going to court because you have a license. It's called a business license. So once you understand that marriage is a business and it's all based on the idea that you are a employee of a corporation and therefore, here's the point. If you're working for a corporation and you're employed by that company, which you are, you're employed by the United States Corporation, incorporated in 1870. If you're working a big corporation, you usually have to wear a tag, a tag on your on lapel showing that you are an employee of that corporation and you're there legally and lawfully, okay? So if that tag shows that you are a member of the corporation, well, the way it works today is that if you are a member of the U.S. corporation, you're a U.S. citizen, you have to have a tag showing you are a member of the corporation is called a social security card. The social security card has your name and your 
tag number and the number of your employment on, on the face of it. But on the back of the Social Security card, at the bottom, you will see numbers. And if it's an older card, it usually has the numbers and the letters on the back of the Social Security card in red. It can be in black or blue. But it normally it was in red. Why? Because the, the numbers on the back of a Social Security card represents your flesh and blood body. Your body is represented on that card because you are a member of the corporation. You are a security for the body social. You're security for the corporation. As long as you get up in the morning and go to work and pay your bills and pay your taxes and pay your fines and your fees and get your permits and do what you're told and keep paying and keep paying and keep paying for everything, you're a security. The corporation is doing real well because money comes in from you every day. You're paying something to the government. And so, therefore, you're a security for the body social, the whole corporation, so that when you retire, you want to go home at the end of the day. You want to retire, or if at, the, at the end of your life you want to retire, you're going to get something called social security. Because why? You are the security for the corporation. So you're getting a little, uh, a, a little dividend back at the end of your life to pay you back so that you will be able to pay your rent and eat and stay alive so you don't give anybody any trouble and try and rob banks because you're broke. So the government gives you a little something, a little stipend to exist on called Social Security because you are the security for the corporation. And so once you understand that, you take your Social Security card and on the back of the card, you will see the numbers and letters on the back of the card. You go to a company in New York like Standard & Poor, and as I told you before starting this conversation, I'm not advising anybody to do anything. I'm just trying to entertain you and educate your mind. I'm not suggesting you do anything. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not practicing law. I'm merely trying to explain to you how the world you live in actually works. If you call one of the companies in New York, which is a stock certificate company, they will tell you how much a stock is worth. If you have a stock, you can call certain companies in New York that handle just that. They tell you exactly how much a stock is worth and who owns it. So you call that stock company in New York, in the stock market, and you ask them, you tell them, I was cleaning my grandmother's garage or her attic, and I found a stock. I found an old stock, and I wanted to know if it's any good. And they will say, well, give us the stock number. You give them the number on the back of your Social Security card. They will go in and check it all out on their computers, and they'll come back and tell you, yes, this belongs to a guy named Hector, and it's worth $7.5 million or $9 million. And you say Hector has nine million in a stock on the New York Stock Exchange. They say yes, he's worth nine million dollars. Did you know you were worth nine million dollars on the New York Stock Exchange? No, nobody's ever told you. Why? Because nobody wants you to know. Because you represent a lot of money. That's why when you go to court, you're going to go to court, and if you're going to be in hot water. All of this is really interesting when you get into how the world really works. It definitely so is. It's really an interesting story when you find out your body, your physical body is worth about $9 million. From 7 to $9 million, you're worth on the New York Stock Exchange. Therefore, if you, get, if you have a home or a car or a motorcycle or airplane, that you owe hundreds of thousands of dollars on, you have to work for the rest of your life to pay, why don't you just call the New York Stock Exchange, give them the stock number on the back of the Social Security card, and ask them, how much is this stock worth? And they'll say, $9 million. Well, then, can I sell off $1 million 
And they say, of course, you can sell your stock if you want to. So you tell the stock company, I want to sell off only one million. So give me the million dollars, and now it's only worth eight million. Now, well, what do you care if it's only worth eight million? That means you got eight million dollars in stock, but you got a million dollars in your hand. And now you can pay off anything with the cash. And most people don't know that. That's why it was crazy when I was hearing how people were losing their homes in 2008 because they couldn't pay for their homes. Why? Because you have no money? You've got a million dollars. You've got millions in your name. On the back of your Social Security card, no one ever told you that. And nobody's ever going to tell you that. Why? Because you're not supposed to know. That's how the that's how the President Trump's and the wealthy people of this world are able to buy hotels and casinos because they're not stupid. They know they have a credit of nine million behind their name. Now all they got to do is build one hotel with the nine million, and now use that hotel as a backup for a loan with the nine million that they own. And before you know it, they can become billionaires if you know how to manipulate the money. So the idea is you are a stock. That's why if your daughter is getting married and she's going to marry an important, wealthy young man, we say, well, he's a good stock. What do you mean? She's marrying a cow? No, but he's wealthy, so he's a good stock. But you are common stock. You don't have what he has. So... He is of good stock. You're not. You're common stock. So that's why in England they have the House of Commons, the common people. The common people is what we call communism, communism. As long as you're just a poor working class, nobody nobody gives a damn about you. Nobody cares anything about you because you're just common stock. But if you're worth billions, the whole world looks at you because you are preferred stock. So once you understand how the world really works, water is very important to this subject. There are wow, two you... kinds of law. There are two kinds of law, and we get to that. There's the law of the land and the law of water. The land law of the land is the law of the custom of the people that live on land. Because people don't live in water, they live on land. So wherever the people are living is called the law of the land. And you've heard that term, the law of the land. Well, there's also the law of the sea. Because there's only two things on the earth. There's law of land and law of the sea. And so the law of the land is the custom of the people who live on the land. So if you're in Mexico in that land, you want to live there, then act like the people. Eat what they eat, do what they do, live the way they live, and live by their laws and their regulations and their culture, and you can be one of them. And now you are uh, you have connected yourself to the law of the land, the custom of the people. But the law of water is the law of money. Money goes through your hands like water. No, money is water. It's the liquid cash flow. It's the liquid. It's called liquidity. It's the liquid cash flow. It's water. And so we say money goes through your hands like water. No, money, according to international law, is a cash flow. It is water. And so if you can't pay for your home, it's underwater. And now you have to... If you go into court, you when you go into court, you're sitting on outside. In there's a there's a gate and a, and a and a fence and a gate. The little gate that the attorneys walk through, they just walk in and out all the time. It's called a water gate. A water gate is a gate and a, you know that holds back the water. So when you come into a court, you're sitting out here with the spectators watching the court but when your name is called you walk up and you have to open up the gate or well, now you are stepping into what is called maritime admiralty law the law of water so now the day the moment you put your hand on that gate and open it up you are now in hot water 
and you're going to have to be bailed out because when you're taking on too much water, you got to bail it out. But when you bail you out, if you can't be bailed out, they'll put you in a cell because your body is 80% water. They'll put you in a cell. That's what we call a battery. A battery is a cell. So they put you in the cell. And your body is a battery. And they're going to buy and sell you. They're going to sell you on the open market. And that's why if you're a prisoner, you're making money for the corporation. It's a very interesting story about how jails work. Be bad. B-A-D, bad on the earth in October. And when it happens, just remember, when it happens, that Jordan Maxwell said it was coming. And it will take a year and four months after October for things to finally settle down and we get back to living our life. A year and four months after October. So it's going to be a whole another year to the next October and then add four more months. And that's going to be in 22, 2022. I'm glad that you bring up the number four because quarantine is also a numerical, uh, it's also representation of four. So can you please continue on that? It's four. Why why is that number so important? Well, because four represents the four seasons of the year. The subject of the life of the sun, he lives in four different seasons, spring, summer, autumn, winter, or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four seasons. And there are 12 signs of the zodiac. So we have 12 apostles. And the reason why we have 12 apostles is because it's the story of God's son, the S-U-N, God's son, the light of the world. And so there's a very big story here that I could go into, and I just don't have the time or the, or the whatever or the energy to explain the bottom line on the end of the world. But we are coming to an end of a time in which freedom is no longer going to exist. When this, when this uh, sickness thing is over, we're going to be a whole different kind of human race, totally. All of your credit cards will now go on to, uh, what's the word, what is that uh, called, the alternative Blockchain uh, technology run by artificial intelligence will track and trace every movement. And if you want to travel, you need the immunity passport, which will be on the blockchain. So this is what I wanted to talk to you about, uh, uh, Jordan, because we have the predictive programming that has been for generations. And the best example that I can look into is Star Trek. And the, the series of the Star Trek is a communist uh, interplanetary order. They have no money. And, you know, there's that idea of the Vulcan. You know, there are so many That's symbols. Right. And so, like, there, this idea that you're talking about how we're not going to recognize the next step of humanity if we choose to embrace fear and not uh, toss off our chains of enslavement and look into our heart and break the, uh, the matrix of control. That's the thing here, though, because this uh, judgment day or the crisis or the pandemic, the biblical terms, essentially, in my mind, is a spiritual test. It's a spiritual challenge. We if and, and you were talking also, you said something important. It's interesting. So you can tell people about this. You can inform them. But if they choose not to see it, they're not going to embrace this information and they're not going to break free. So that's no. that's a, that's the a thing. Oh, well, what that's do you exactly think? That's right. As if I can tell you, like I said, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not practicing law. I'm not advising you legally. I'm just talking to you to entertain you and to give you knowledge to think about that the whole world you live on, the whole earth you live on is a business and it's being run behind the scenes by the big corporations. And so the United States is a company, it's a corporation. And so once you understand that, that's why you don't have any civil rights. You don't have any rights. You don't have any rights when you go into court. You have no rights to do or say anything. So that's why is because we're not living in the United States of America. We're living in a corporation and you are an employee of a corporation. Therefore, if you are in Mexico and you're coming across the border or in Canada, you're coming into this country illegally, 
you are an undocumented worker, meaning you're not supposed to be here. Why? Because this is a company, it's a corporation, and it's like, very similar, when you come across the border, it's like you breaking into Ford Motor Company at 2 o'clock in the morning, breaking in and busting a glass in the back door and breaking into Ford Motor Company. And you can be arrested for that because you're not an employee and you have no reason to be there. You have come in illegally. And therefore, because this is a country which is a corporation, the corporation called United States can put a mechanics lien on you. If you if I paint your home and you don't pay me, I can put a lien on your house. I can't hurt you, but I can put a lien on the house, which means you can't do anything with that house unless you pay me because you owe me first. And so it's called a lien, a mechanic's lien. So if you come across the border from, from Mexico, undocumented and illegal, and you're making money here, the corporation called United States comp Company, the corporation will put a lien on you. And now you become known as an alien. A lien has been put on you. You are an alien an alien or an alien, they have put a lien on your body. And this is why you are referred to as an alien. It's really a very interesting story about how the world really works. And I mean, there's so much to tell, so much to say that I oh, don't yes. even know where to start. It's just an incredible. I am amazed that you have the mind that you do and you're able to understand the basics of the kind of stuff I'm talking about. But we could sit here for the next eight hours and I could tell you things you've never heard before about how this world actually works and what is being done to us as a people and as a nation. We're going to wake up one day and find out we've been taken over, we've been had, and it's finished. No more jobs, no more money, no more food, no more nothing. You're finished and you're through. And it will be the fall of the Roman Empire. Because when Rome took over Europe, Caesar found out that there was still one place he didn't own, and that was Britannia and Britain. He owned the whole of Europe and, run, and controlled it through the Roman Empire. But he did not control the British Empire. So Caesar ordered Britain taken over. The Roman Empire went into Britannia. The soldiers went into Britannia to overthrow the government of Britain. And they set up, Caesar's government was set up to run Britannia, and the place that they set Caesar's government up was in the city of York, England. He wants to take over the whole world, and, and England is all over the world. So if he takes over the Roman, if the Roman Empire takes over the British Empire, now he can control the world. And so he set up his government in York, England. And so today we have a place called New York. And New York is called the Empire State. Yeah, it's the new Roman Empire under Caesar. Under Caesar and Rome, which we call the Holy Father. The Holy Father runs New York. You don't do anything in New York unless you get permission from the Holy Father. He represents God. He is a Godfather. And so, therefore, today we are being controlled by Rome, the Roman Empire. And that's why New York is called the Empire State. The Empire State has a building. They call it the Empire State Building. Why? Because it represents the Roman Empire. And People when you get see... lost in this. I'm, I just want to make sure that people understand this. His, patterns in history are cyclical. Empires, they rise and fall. But 
the history that we were taught in school is not the whole picture. These empires, like the Roman empires, they c converted themselves, they reinvented themselves, and they held on to power. And for generation, they had bloodlines or specific families that ran empires and different departments of the empire. So what we see today is just the same of the past today is just redressed with different nation states but those powers of the ancient times like rome like mr jordan maxwell is talking about they're still present and they're still trying to control and influence humanity now sir i know that you know i've i've held you over for a long time and i hope in the future that we continue this conversation however for this our last segment what can you leave us what resounding information do we need uh, to prepare ourselves for this pandemic I would say the most important thing that people hearing me at this moment need to do is begin a new life based on education, not just numbers and, uh, and alphabet and, uh, and mathematics. No, I'm talking about a serious knowledge of the world in which you live. And I have so many people, because I've been doing radio for almost 50 years, I have so many people writing and emailing me, asking me, Jordan, where do I start? What, what, how would I even begin to know what, what you're talking about? Where do I start to learn? My suggestion is you go to my website. That's where I put everything. I put everything on my website. Go to my website, which is Jordan Maxwell Show, S-H-O-W. You have to add that word in or you're not coming to my website. The reason why is because there are different websites out there on the web with my name on them, but I don't own them. I got nothing to do with them. They're using my name to make money, to sell their, their books and tapes or whatever, but it's not my website. I, do, I have nothing to do with them. So my website is Jordan Maxwell Show. The Jordan is like the River Jordan in, in Israel. Jordan, J-O-R-D-A-N, Jordan Maxwell, M-A-X-W-E-L-L. -L. Go to jordanmaxwellshow.com, and you will see a little flyer or a little link that says to join Jordan's research website. That's the second website I have. And it's a research website. So you join my research website. And on that particular website that you find on my Jordan Maxwell Show website, you go to the research website and join it. You then become, you see hundreds of pictures and documents and audio lectures, secret papers, laws, research papers, all kinds of research I've been doing over the years on all the dark secrets of the world. And it's all there on my research website. So if you don't know where to start, why don't you just start with my website and I will give you all kinds of information. And all of the information on my, re on my research website gives you footnotes, where to go to look for information if you want to do it, the research yourself. Here's where you go, and here's who you listen to, and here's the book you get, and here's where the information is on all kinds of subjects. So for people who would like to know more, just go on my, on my website, jordanmaxwellshow.com, and join my research website. It's only a one-time small donation, only one donation for a lifetime subscription. It's got everything on there you'll ever need to know. I'm putting more stuff on every day. Every day my webman's putting new stuff on. But he's only one person. He can only do so much work in one day. And so I've got tons of material to put on there. Well, we've already got a big research website. But I'm gonna, it's going to be much bigger real soon. As soon as he gets the stuff put on. i got brand new research on all kinds of off the wall, strange stuff that you've never heard, laws that you didn't know about, words and terms you've never heard, and how the world really works. So I'm just saying to the audience, if you'd like to know how to start doing your own research, go on Jordan Maxwell's show and join my research website. 
Thank Thanks. you for letting me talk about it. Oh, I appreciate your presence and I appreciate your information. And once again, we're grateful that you were here to elucidate us with the true way that the world is run because it's not the way we take it for granted. There's a bigger agenda happening. Thanks, Jordan. We will talk to you very soon. Best of luck with everything. And I hope everything works out for you. Well, thank you. And I think the same thing for you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate your being able to understand what I'm trying to do is to wake people up and teach them and so that they will understand how to live in this world. So go on my website, the Jordan Maxwell Show, and join my research website. And anytime you want to do a show, just let me know. We'll do it again. But next time we should be able to go into all of the dark stuff of history that most people have never heard because I've been doing this kind of research for 60 years. I'm so excited. Again, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk later. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Bye-bye.